I have a very odd relationship with The Winter's Tale because um, I hated it. I hated it in school and I hated it in Cambridge. And I hated it for moral reasons, really. Um, it, it's, I was at a Quaker school and the Quakers are not literary. They don't put literature very high on their priorities. They put morality very high on their priorities. And this gave a slight twist to my attitude to the world. And one of the things I thought about The Winter's Tale was that Shakespeare seems to think that with sleight of hand, he can take the whole of Hermione's adult life from her. Um, she is spirited away by Paulina. Her child is taken, one of her children dies mm. and the other is mm. abandoned. Mm. And she doesn't appear again until the last scene where a wonderful reconciliation takes place. And I just sat there as a child and said, but it couldn't have been a wonderful reconciliation. What has she been doing for all those sort of 17, 20 years when Miranda was growing up? It, it could, um, mm. um, and I don't mean Miranda, I mean Perdita. Perdita yeah. mm. But um, then finally I got to see that plays are different even from novels that things can happen on the stage which can move you. I don't think you could do that in a novel. You couldn't just take the whole of somebody's life and say it wasn't there and ignore it and then produce a beautiful reconciliation. But I, I came to the conclusion in the end that in some curious way you can be very moved by the end of The Winter's Tale. So I'm going to read descriptions in two of my novels of productions of The Winter's Tale. Um, which are rather different from each other. And I'm going to start with the later novel, which is the children's book, in which um, the, the sort of heroine of the children's book, insofar as there is a heroine who is a, a children's writer of some ferocity, is caused to play Hermione in an amateur dramatical production of The Winter's Tale. Um, down in Rye in the summer at a kind of arts festival. I need my... Yep, your glasses. Thank you. And this, in a sense, is sort of played for comedy. Um, her, her husband is Humphrey. So they came slowly to the performance of the play and the end of the summer school. The theatre was the wild garden at the side of Perch's house, which had once been a formal garden and had unkempt hedges, which had once been clipped yew and were now bearded and tufted and invaded by brambles and old man's beard. Staining com commandeered some students and helpers, including Dobbin and Frank Mallet, to make papier mache statuary on wire frames which in the winter scenes were stark and in the summer scenes were garlanded with silk flowers and real flowers mixed. He had brought footlights with limelight which altered the shadows on these forms, making them bald and sinister or bright and clear. There was a goat-horned herm with shaggy thighs and a naked girl with falling hair seen from the back. There were two squatting, cross-legged little fawns who grinned at the stage corners in the harvest scene and were absent in the Sicilian sculpted palace. Then there was Hermione's plinth. This is when she's a statue. He was ed exigent about this object. He wanted the woman statue higher than the cast and the audience with the moon, which was full, silver and shadowy behind her. He wanted both stone mother and fleshly daughter to be chastely clothed in endless swirling pleats of white cloth and exhausted Olive, who was playing Hermione, by rearranging both her standing place and her complicated garment over and over again. He pointed out that by moonlight with her back to the moon and a veil cast over her, she would glow in the shadows. The shape of the dark bushes and her mysterious cowled head against the moon would be magical. And she must move when she stepped down, like an automaton. 
as though the force of gravity, not her own will, lifted each foot, bent each knee, held her arms in place. I don't know what to do with my arms. Practically, you will need to hold on to the pleats whilst you're up there, or they will come out. Your right arm across your breast to hold the veil down at your left shoulder. The left arm around the waist to hold the cloth in it so it doesn't swirl away when you move. You need white fingers, rings on your fingers, ivory or moonstone. I'll see what I can find. Olive was not very good at gliding like an automaton and became irritated by the constant repetition. You were related to the stone man in Don Giovanni. You were a sister of Pygmalion's ivory Galatea. Think of the stone music. I am a woman of a certain age who has borne a number of children, said Olive dryly. You were a fine figure of a woman, said Staining, who was still thinking in terms of sculpture. So there she stood on the first night with the moon behind her, making shadows in her wound garments, which she clutched pale knuckled. She was surprised by how very difficult it was to keep still for so long. She thought about her body under all its unaccustomed white sheeting, like a dressmaker's dummy, she thought, something vague and muffled. She was aging. She was pleated across her stomach as well as over her shoulders. She was still in her time. Prosper Kane admired her. Herbert Methley desired her. Humphrey wanted her, but she was cross with Humphrey. She had cheered herself somewhat going over Humphrey's conversation with Maid Marian, who is his new love interest, by remembering that it was quite clear from what he said that he had not known either that Marian was the new schoolmistress at Puxty or that she was coming to the summer school. It would go by, she thought, as other things had gone by. She made what she hoped was an invisible adjustment to her stance, as her ankles were both numb and strained. A woman on a plinth can see over a hedge she is designed to protrude above. <laughs> there in the lane behind the yew hedge, their heads bent together, <laughs> were Humphrey in his royal robes and hose, his red hair artificially whitened by August, and Marion Oakshot, in a pretty dress with forget-me-not sprigs on cream. She was brushing the white powdering from his hair off the velvet shoulder of his cloak. It was a very wifely gesture. When she had brushed it away, she patted his arm in an even more wifely way. Rage gripped the statue, who nevertheless must remain motionless. <laughs> Rather deliberately, she thought of Herbert Methley's investigating fingers. Involuntarily, she remembered a conversation about sex amongst ludicrous and alarming cows. She was her own woman. <laughs> that, that's sort of using it for comedy. Um, <laughs> in a whistling woman, right at the end of the novel, which is therefore at the end of the quartet of novels, um, the characters go to a performance of A Winter's Tale, The Winter's Tale, and um, it was when I was writing that that I suddenly, as it were, got it. I suddenly saw how to read or see The Winter's Tale so that I wasn't just furious with the statue. Mm. Um, the characters who are present are Bill Potter, who is a rather Levisite English schoolmaster, who shares my views about the statue. Mm. He thinks it's ludicrous and, um, and really just doesn't work, and he doesn't like the play. Um, and Daniel, who is a clergyman who married Bill's daughter, Stephanie, um, which really upset Bill because he hated Christianity. It was kind of Victorian plot in reverse. You can't marry if you're not a Christian if you're a Victorian, but you can't marry Bill's daughter if you are a Christian, and he wouldn't go to the wedding. And so he, he, he's an ill-tempered man. And um, the other people there are Frederica, who is the daughter of Bill, and Luke Liscard Peacock, who is a, 
irrelevant scientist. He just happens to be there. And Marcus, who is Bill's son. The important thing for you to know, if you haven't read the quartet, is that Stephanie, who was um, Bill's daughter and Daniel's wife, died very suddenly in an accident in volume two. And the people have not really got over the mourning. So they're sitting together in a row in the front of this play. And oh, the other thing is that um, Stephanie's daughter is actually playing Perdita. Mm. So there's this kind of mixture of the family life, of the family in my four novels. And the four novels, it might also be worth saying, began with the kind of glorious 1950s overexcitement about now we're going to have Shakespearean drama again. You've probably forgotten all that if you ever knew it, but there was going to be great verse drama. T.S. Eliot said there was, Christopher Fry said there was. Uh, a verse drama is put on in volume one. And the whole sort of new Elizabethan age with the coronation of Elizabeth II um, slowly doesn't become the new Elizabethan age as the novels wind on into the hippies of the 60s. Um, the Winter's Tale is produced by Alexander, who wrote the verse drama in volume one. The Winter's Tale was performed in the Great Hall at Long Royston. Alexander had asked Harold Bomberg, who had played Gauguin in his London production of The Yellow Chair, to play Leontes, and had found a Hermione amongst the lecturers in English in the university, who had been at Cambridge with Frederica and was now a medievalist. The rest of the cast were university teachers and students, with the exception of Perdita. Perhaps sentimentally, but also because Blessford Grammar School said she was outstanding, he had chosen Mary Orton. For this reason, Daniel, as well as Frederica, Agatha, Saskia and Leo, had come north to see the first night. They sat together in a long row, Bill Potter next to Daniel, Winifred next to Will, who was on the end, Frederica between Daniel and Alexander. The university dignitaries and the county notables were in front of them, including Matthew Crowe in his own armchair, wrapped in blankets. Alexander had had a hand in the costumes. They were vaguely classical with Elizabethan touches. In the first act, with its crescendo of jealousy, and its polarized trial scene, the men wore black with touches of crimson and the women wore white with touches of purple. The boy, Mamilius, wore a miniature version of his father's black robe, standing collar and tights. He spread the wings of his cloak to tell his ghost story, a sad tale's best for winter. He told his father, I am like you, they say, and went off to die of grief and humiliation. Gerard Wine Noble listened with delight and amazement to the tortured syntax, the straining thread of language of Leontes' agony of jealousy, apparently incoherent, beyond bearing, and entirely beautiful. My life stands in the level of your dreams, said Hermione. Your actions are my dreams, returned her terrible husband. Frederica wanted to cry at the closed perfection of those running feet. She remembered her dream of Luke Discard Peacock. What relation did it have now to the non-dreamy nature of remembered actions? There were drinks at the interval. Luke decided he would speak to Frederica, made his way across the hall, and found her mistress. You should have been Mamilius, said Miss Godden, if Mary is to be Perdita. Frederica put her arm round her son. I don't want him to be Mamilius, she said. Hello, Luke. In any case, he's in his own school play. He's in The Wizard of Oz. I, I wanted to be the cowardly lion, but I'm the scarecrow. I sing. I dance. I must come and see that, said Alexander. He said to Bill, how are you bearing up? Oh, the first half, splendid. It's always splendid. The verse, the pace, you've got it very well. It's the damn statue. 
I'm waiting to see what on earth you can have done with that impossible piece of stage machinery. You do have to lend it your imagination. I have never been able to do so, never once. Just because he got old and self-indulgent is no reason why I should. Most of this meant nothing to Luke. He said to Frederica, I saw you interviewing that herpetologist. Alexander had dressed the sheep shearers and pastoral dancers in sharp pinks and blues and yellows, new colors of the 60s, colors of the flower children, dyes that hadn't been created when Frederica played the young Elizabeth in 1953 on the terrace of the house. It was winter outside and in, and Alexander filled the stage, the space under the minstrel's gallery, under the plaster frieze of marble men and maidens, under blanched forest boughs, with an artificial summer of silk flowers, poppies and lilies, roses and delphiniums, marigolds and convolvulus, made by a clever Chinese artist he had found working for tiny sums in Soho. Mary Orton appeared in a demure white cotton dress and a floral crown, weightless and intricate. intricate. She began to speak Perdita's flower speech. O oh, Preserpina, for the flowers now that frighted thou let'st fall from Dissy's wagon. Daniel was quite unprepared for the effect that this would have on him. She was acting a woman a year or two older than herself and was full of the careful dignity of speaking great verse clearly. She was, in her own world, not trying to charm, but enchanting. He saw not his daughter, but his wife. Only for a moment, but entirely. And remembering life, he remembered death automatically, and his eyes filled with tears. He heard a small sound next to him. Bill Potter was rubbing his cuff angrily across his faded eyes. An audience is one and many. It is moved separately and together. Daniel pushed at his own eyelashes and with his, with his own other hand touched Bill's knee to show that they knew. The play swept on and broke up into irritating little runnels of scenes in which the greatest of playwrights evaded the recognitions, reparations, climax everyone had a right to expect and fobbed off his audience with Horatio Obliqua reported speech when the father met the lovely living daughter who rep replaced both his dead son and her exposed infant self for whom he had mourned for 16 unstaged years. What a mess thought Frederica, as she always thought. I can see why he did it, and we find ways to excuse it, because it is what he did. But it is what a mess. And all squeezed and rushed and jangled together for the sake of the damned statue. Alexander had done his best, like many before and after him. He had put the woman on a plinth and had veiled her in imitation of those virtuoso 17th century marble carvings of metaphorical stone veiling over metaphorical stone flesh. With hidden gold safety pins, he had pulled the fine muslin back over the dead queen's face as though a wind was blowing through the twilight of the windless underworld. He had damped it very slightly and the contours of the face the nose, the cheekbone, the eyeballs, the lips and brow could be seen. They were highlit with a white spotlight, a white of a purity and coldness also unavailable in 1953, a dead white that made pure shadows. Paulina the psychopomp led, led the repentant intemperate king, his rage cool, into the vault followed by his reconciled friend, his daughter, and her young lover. It is an impossible piece of creaking stage machinery. Leontes, see, my lord, would you not deem it breathed and that those veins did verily bear blood? Masterly done, the very life seems warm upon her lip. Leontes, the fixture of her eye has motion in it as we are mocked with art. 
mocked, mouthed Bill Potter silently. Daniel saw. Alexander's lighting changed to rose and gold, which filled the whole space under the minstrel's gallery with a liquid shimmer in which, to the sound of music, rebec, hautbois, lute, the veiled figure, its face pressed against its seer cloth, began to flow down off its pedestal and to cross the ground. The stage vault was heaped silk flowers, transparent like the discs of honesty or the operculum which closes a snail shell in winter. The rose and gold light transfigure these drifts of ghost petals, making them substantial. Mary Perdita had one in her hair, which now caught this new light and shone out like a living flame. The statue, the only moving thing in this dumbstruck gathering, swept on towards the king and lifted its veil like a bride and held out a rose-bathed face for a kiss. Mocked, tricked, Daniel Orton and Bill Potter wept and pushed away their cheers. Tears, sorry. Afterwards, there was the usual rejoicing and celebration. Bill Potter tried to tell Daniel about his revelation. After all, he had shared it with him. But Daniel was pushing through the crowds looking for his daughter. So he told Frederica, I've just understood. Never too old to understand something. The thing about the late comedies, the thing is that what they do, the effect they have, isn't anything to do with fobbing you off with a happy ending when you know you witnessed a tragedy. It's about art. It's about the necessity of art. The human needs to be mocked with art. You can have a happy ending precisely because you know in life they don't happen. When you are old, you have the right to the irony of a happy ending because you don't believe it. Are you listening? Frederica was abstractly looking for a scientist who was putting his coat on to leave. Thank you. Thank you. Performance of The Winter's Tale, but realised very differently. Both cases, however, really show us how pertinent, how relevant this play becomes then at a very, you know, in very different circles, at a very different stage. I mean, in many ways, these characters are like, you know, possessed by Shakespeare. I mean, take the first one from the children's book. It's Olivia, you know, seeing that all these adulterous affairs going on while she's acting Hermione. I mean, she's also, you know, after the show, she's also in bed with another man, doesn't she? I mean, she ends up, you know, also... This poor yeah, woman. Poor woman, yeah, what can she, <laughs> she do? She says yeah. it's her duty to go to bed with another man if he's... Yeah, yeah if her husband is, yeah. And, and then she doesn't really enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but also, like, when she first gets together with her husband early on in the novel, it's also through a Shakespeare play. It's um, Midsummer Night's Dream, isn't it? Yes, it is. I think, um, I think my generation, we grew up, reading novels that were permeated by Shakespeare. Mm. You just found a line from him here, you found a line mm. from him there, you recognised it, this gave you a peculiar, comfortable feeling, yeah. and you went on reading. And I have the feeling now that I'm writing for an audience, a large part of which doesn't pick it up when I do that. <laughs> I mean, this is very explicit, they've got to pick it up because it, yeah, well, it's quoted straight, but yes. a lot of the things okay. I slide in, mm which I was fairly confident people would know what it was in the mm. 50s. Mm. I, now, I now feel doubt. I don't do it so much. and I, I think this is a loss. Mm. Mm. Well, to me it is. I, I... Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting, though, that you said early on that certain things you can do in the novel with Shakespeare that perhaps you can't do in drama, like this statue scene. It's something, you know, it's you know, dramatic in the sense that this is the immediacy of coming to life, like coming out of the grave, whereas in the novel it works very differently. Do you think that as a novelist you have greater ease or great more liberties to work with Shakespeare than perhaps working in his own medium? Because it's not plays that you're writing, but tales, narratives, where the plays just figure in this different form and this different... Yes, I, th I think the novel narrative runs alongside him, mm. and he's telling the primal narrative. Yeah. Um, the play is a much more... Um, the play is full of actors and a novel is entirely full of one voice, however 
Mm -hmm. You know, you vary it or change it. Mm -hmm. And however the novelist doesn't say I think or I feel, there is one string of language going on. Whereas um, every time a play is put on, I think it's more different than every time a novel is read. When I said earlier yeah. during our dialogue that yeah. every time you reread something, it's not the same as the time you read it before. I mean, nobody ever reads every word of a novel. And so every time you read the same novel, you've skipped a different bit <laughs> and you've got a different shape in your head. <laughs> and I go about telling readers, you know, you have every right to skip bits of my novel and I do hope you'll come back and read it again and skip other bits. <laughs> Next but time, I yeah. do, Nobody reads every word, whereas if you go to a play, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. do hear every word that anybody has put mm -hmm. on and mm -hmm. it has a different verbal structure. Mm -hmm. And the characters are related differently to each other. They are voices in a different way mm -hmm. from the characters in a novel. Mm -hmm. And you can't mm -hmm. ever go into their heads. They can, but you can't. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, but I wonder whether that difference in genre perhaps also bears other resonances. Like in the while well, in the eighties, Ted Hughes was introducing a book of poems that you know collected poems about Shakespeare, and he says poets have a you know, better time with Shakespeare because he is in a different medium, not so much drama. He says dramatists always kind of feel threatened by Shakespeare because he like cannibalizes them. And he was yeah. like very explicit about the burden that Shakespeare can be to contemporary writing. Whereas someone like himself, or I suppose someone like you as a novelist, can take more liberties. Could, could Shakespeare in that sense be burdensome or troublesome also? I think he has been a burden mm. to the British playwright ever since. <laughs> I mean, I think some playwrights here. there is an <laughs> argument that he yeah. not playwriting to pieces for quite a time. Mm. And people began to work in much smaller areas. Mm. They couldn't do him, so they... Mm. And I, I was saying earlier today over coffee to somebody, we did a paper at Cambridge when I was a student called the Tragedy Paper. Mm -hmm. They couldn't find enough in English to fill it up, so we had to do Ibsen and Chekhov. And... Um, <laughs> and various other things. I mean, yeah. we didn't have to do that with yeah. the novel or the poetry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was felt very strongly you shouldn't mm -hmm. study anything that wasn't written in English because mm -hmm. we weren't meant to be studying English, mm -hmm. but they couldn't do it. I, I, think, um, I think for a long time he had a rather daunting effect on the theatre. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it also has a daunting effect on some of your characters, I feel. I mean, like Frederica, <laughs> Frederica Potter, the, you know, in the second passage we heard, I mean, she is full of Shakespeare. I mean, starting off with, let's refer to where she plays the Virgin Queen early on in her life. And then at key moments in her life, everything seems to come back to Shakespeare. It's, you know, that moment when they mourn for Stephanie, when they really begin crying through watching Shakespeare, or when she has all that marital to trouble with, um, with her husband, with Nigel. And, you know, I think she goes into the bathroom and reads Much Ado About Nothing, as if I've it were... That. Yeah, as if she were, like, of rescuing herself from that situation, going back into Shakespeare as if this was like, you know, the, you know, the text that, that helps us cope with daily trouble. Isn't that also in some ways an extraordinary impact on these figures? Yes, I think, I mean, it's just the history of my life. If I, I, um, I reread him mm. from time to time because I mean, all the writers here have been saying he is mm. the English language. Mm. And for me, if I started thinking very hard about the English language, I would quite rapidly arrive, arrive at some sentence written by him. Mm. Um, you can't get away from him. I don't mm. resent it. I'd like to say I still resent what Frederica still resents. Is that you expect when um, Perdita comes back mm -hmm. and Florizel, and they're going to meet Leontes. And he's going to meet his daughter and recognize that she is his daughter. And this is going to be a wonderful scene. Mm -hmm. And two courtiers tell it very fast in Oratio Obliqua. Um, they just say, then they met each other, then they did this, then they did that, and they get off that scene so that you can have the statue. Mm -hmm. And when, when we were taught this as students, we were told they couldn't have two recognition scenes one after the other. I never accepted that argument. I think that's a bad scene. <laughs> I, I think it cheats me. I have been waiting for this yeah. moment of recognition mm -hmm. for the whole of the play. I've been waiting for Leontes to be mm -hmm. told that Perdita is his daughter, and Shakespeare doesn't let me see it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and, 
I mean, my own theory is that he found it was too long to put on and had to... <laughs> yeah, it was a practical to man of the theatre, yeah. Yes, he had to insert yeah. a short scene in order to get a... Mm. to allow the last scene to be longer, but I still think it's a dreadful disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we're not... Yeah. I got annoyed reading it all over again when I was coming here. Yeah. But still, even as an annoyance, Shakespeare is extremely present, extremely, as it were, you know, relevant with us all the time. I mean, to the point that there's a couple of times Frederica asks herself that question, who is it that can tell me who I am? Who is it that can tell me? She's like, it's in her divorce case, and sort of the moment later when she reviews her life, who am I? Who is it that can tell me? And again, that is a question quoted from Shakespeare. I think it's King Lear, isn't it? When you know, he asked that question. Yes. So I think it's in some ways, isn't this a terrifying, you know, a terrifying moment when she asks, who am I? And the only language available is someone else's, Shakespeare's language. Isn't that it's, um, you know, kind of possession or...? I mean, one of the glories of him is not only these long and beautifully constructed things like Prospero's speech, but these little short, flat sentences mm -hmm. like that. Like that one, yes. From which, King Lear, um, yeah. which somehow absolutely states something. Um, and as we are mocked with art, I, I love that one. And, yes. Um, my life stands in the level of your dreams. There are several of them in the Winter's Tale that come in amongst all the complicated language. And um, it's a particular feeling you get reading him, these short things. You think, yes, he's put it right, that is it. And you, do, uh, you don't feel you're appropriating it or anything. But again, I go back to the fact that I think when I was a girl, people like me lived in a kind of current mm. of his language. Mm -hmm. And we just sort of looked around and there, there was some of it that was mm -hmm. about what we were trying to think about. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think I felt he was restricting. I felt he was liberating. Mm. Well, maybe I'm speaking from a German point of view, because also you know, in Germany this has been very much an issue also. You know, not just, you know, how we all revere Shakespeare and all this, you know, to the, to the point that he's kind of naturalized, you know, but also to the point that people want to get away from exercise and really. There's this very famous 19th century poem, Germany is Hamlet, yeah, Deutschland ist Hamlet, Freilichkeit, it's a revolutionary poem, it's a very political poem, but it ends by saying, you know, no, let's not be Hamlet, let's be something else, let's try and get away from this. And I wonder if this is a sense also of, you know, trying and exercise Shakespeare at a certain point. That's interesting, because mm. um, when you were speaking, I thought, I don't ever identify with the characters, mm. only the language. Mm. Yes. The, la the sort of run of the language yeah. is my life, and that's, that's one thing. But it's a mistake to think that you are Hermione or Perdita or, let alone, God help you, Hamlet. <laughs> <laughs> It's very German to decide that <laughs> yes. Hamlet is who you are. Yes, <laughs> yes it is, yeah. Yeah. Yes, um, yeah. yeah. Well, this is an even older passion of mine than Shakespeare. Um, another of my mother's academic books that I got hold of by accident, and it was called Asgard and the Gods, and it was the sort of, it was the most wonderful connection, collection of Norse mythology, and it wasn't written for children, it was... It was written for people, and it told all the stories several times, all in different ways. And I read it, I read it sort of about every three weeks, um, and it was the war. And you had to put your head outside the bedroom door and read by the light on the landing because you weren't supposed to put the light on. And so every time I think of Asgard and the gods, I think of these Norse gods. It had most wonderful illustrations. And it was collected by somebody called Herr... Wegner, mm. and um, mm. who wrote a most wonderful preface. So when I wrote, um, when the Canongate Press rang me up and said, would I write a myth in their myth series? Would I write a version of a myth? There was only one myth I was ever going to write, and that was the death of the gods, um, the Norse one. And I'm going to read the bit just before the gods die which I really enjoyed writing. Um, but there was a thing, there was a thing before the death of the gods called the Fimble Winter, or Fimble Winter, it probably was. And it didn't end. Everybody waited for this winter to end and it just didn't. <coughs> Thank you. 
It began slowly. There were flurries of sharp snow over the fields <coughs> where the oats and barley were ready to be harvested. There was ice on the dew ponds at night when the harvest moon, huge and red, was still in the sky. There was ice on water jugs and an increasing thin, bitter wind that did not let up so that they became used to keeping their heads hooded and down. There was a wonderful harvest of frosted grapes to make the Moselle wine, the ice wine, which was put down in casks. Winter vegetables wilted on their stems, frozen before they were plump. The leaves in the woods and forests fell early and blew about in the eddies of bitter wind. The light, at first, was clear and cold. Things glittered, ice in the cart tracks, icicles growing on sills and bushes, and not shrinking, not melting, thrusting on. Then, as winter set in, the sky darkened. It was full of thick iron-grey clouds, full of snow, and the air itself was full of snow and hail and ice splinters eddying. The surface of the earth hardened, shrinking and dense, frozen too deep for spades to disturb. Root vegetables could not be lifted, could not be disinterred. Ice thickened on lakes and spread sluggishly into the courses of rivers. Fish went down and down, swimming at first under the ice shelves, then settling into the mud, cold and limp, barely breathing. Men went out with axes and hacked off buckets of ice to melt in the house for drinking. At first, this excited them. It was a test of strength, a test of manhood. Cattle were enclosed and the sheep brought in, those who did not die in the drifts, which rose higher and did not diminish. Hens came into houses and pigs lay by the hearth. Men went out on snowshoes and skis and sledges and took down trees for firewood and hunted the increasingly furtive and cunning wood creatures, rabbits and hares, small deer and partridges, small fowl with their feet frozen to the twigs in the bushes. They needed to survive until the spring until the days at last grew longer and the sun would melt the snow and the ice and the wind would die down and skins could be in the air without being frostbitten. The shortest day came and the humans danced stamping in the snow and made bonfires to, to greet the turn of the year. But the year did not exactly turn. The sky became a paler grey, that was all and the earth and air and water stayed icy. They began to use things that could not be replaced. The pig's throat was slit, and it was butchered and frozen and roasted. Those hens that did not lay were strangled and plucked and boiled, and were not replaced because most chicks died. Feeding the sheep and the horses and donkeys became hard, very hard because of the ruined crops and the frozen fields. Courage became endurance and soup was needed too much to be fed to the dying. Outside in the perpetual twilight, wolves howled and padded. They were hungry and angry. This they thought was how it would be when the fimble winter came. The fat sun was dull red, sullen like embers. She gave little light, and what there was was ruddy or bloody. They longed in their bones and their brains for clear light, for a warm wind, for buds, for green leaves. The winter stretched into another year and another. The seas froze. Icebergs clashed by the coasts and floated into the bays. This was, they began to understand, not a likeness of the Fimble winter, but the thing itself. They became raiders. They overran each other's houseteads, howling and roaring, slaughtering the weak and emptying the meagre stores. They drank what mead there was, swallowed the wine as though there was no tomorrow, 
which they began to believe was true. Hungry creatures, hungry men will eat anything. The battle winners feasted among the dead bodies, which were being torn at by creeping, crouching beasts. They gripped each other and fell about the fire, fornicating with whomever was to hand, with whatever was to hand. They bit and kissed and chewed and swallowed and fought and struggled and waited for the world to end, which it did not, not yet. They ate each other, of course, in the end. The skies thickened and thickened. Things, Jesus, leathery winged female things, wailed in the wind and perched on the crags, staring and screaming. Needherger, the great worm, who gnawed the roots of Yggdrasil, came out and sucked the blood from the dead as they lay in the freezing slime. From the kettle wood where Loki lay bound among the geysers, which still spouted hot, came a louder howl of wolves. Wolves in the wood, wolves padding over the snow, wolves with blood on their fangs, wolves in the mind. Wind time, wolf time, before the world breaks up. That was the time they were in. Well, thank you. <laughs> I love this sort of, the different rhythms, the sounds of these Germanic alliteration, this was, this was really I tried really very hard to use only Germanic and Nordic yeah. words. Yes. I, I tried very hard to keep the French yes. and the Latin out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally stunning, totally stunning contrast. I think this is a very strong moment to end this wintry evening on. But before we drown any of the books, there are plenty of them to buy outside, I should say. And Antonia Vai will be very happy to sign them. Thanks so much for sharing this with us. It was a fantastic evening. Thank you. Thank you.